fun too. And here is the kind of cows that they had, and they're the big, big, big horns. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Well, let's see what happens. So the boys went into the bushes. They looked until they found some big long vines, which big leaves on them. They very carefully, the boys, wound them around each other until each other looked like a big pile of leaves. <laughs> oh, this will be good, they laughed at one another. Father will never need to know how we got them old cows to the river. And we will not have to go it, near that Nigeria. She is such a big black cow and big horns. Whew, I don't like her. Very carefully, they started towards the cows. Closer and closer they came. The cows looked at them. What was that coming? The boys looked at the cows. The cows looked at the boys, but the cows did not move. The boys went closer and closer. Nigeria, that mean old cow with the calf, was standing there looking at the boys. Guess what? She suddenly, she put her head down, and when you see a cow put her head down, she's up to something and made a loud moo, a terrible noise. The boys tried to pull off the vines and run, but they had to pull hard before they had put the vines on so very well. Nigeria came a running down the path after them. There was, she was right behind them. Boy, what a terrible, terrible noise she was making. The boys ran and ran and pulled at the vines. Then father heard something. Huh. That, hey, that sounds like that Nigeria. He cried, I am sure of it. Now, what has those boys done to her? <laughs> the man picked up a big stick and ran up the hill. Down the hill, the boys came running. Nigeria was right behind them. She was so close she could have pushed them down if she had tried. Father ran to them. He hit the old cow with his stick. He hit her many times until she went back up the hill. And all the while, Nigeria was running up the hill. Uh, Agosha and his brother were running down the hill. <laughs> the little boys <laughs> later came home and the father I will leave you to guess what they had to say to one another but do you think the next time them boys were told to take the cows to the to get the water do you think they uh, remembered to obey their father and to do it exactly the way their dad told them to do in our <clears throat> Memory verse was Proverbs 23, 12, which says, Apply your mind to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. You may go. Thank you, Judy, for that story. And now we'll have our special music by Vicki Johnson. Sorry, I'm having some technical issues. Trying to get my words to come up here. 
I love technology. Okay. I mean, it's Okay, I'm just going to have to let it run till it catches up the words, so just go ahead. Start it over. Maybe it's going to actually get me the words this time. Okay, there we go. When, when one thing fails, go to a different plan. Sorry about that, guys. So we're going to try it one more time. Yeah. 
on you, when I am dry, you fill my cup, you are my all. Thank you, Vicki. That's a beautiful song. Of course, the enemy doesn't like for us to um, to um, exalt the Lord and try to hinder it, but uh, that was worth waiting for, I think. Um, now it's time for our scripture reading. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. If you want to turn there. The Bible says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'd like to invite Brother Brian now to the pulpit to share his message entitled, Climbing the Ladder. That's it? All right. So the text that we read in Peter needs to be studied. <clears throat> this is part two of a series um, writing a book called The Natures of Christ and the last Adam. And yes, the S on natures 
is what the whole book revolves around because as I've explained to you, I think in the past, um, I was schooled in classical theology in, in, in the Adventist system. And then I heard another side existing in Adventism. And my question was, well, which is it? You know, um, I want to know more about my Savior because there is nothing more important than knowing about Jesus except knowing him, right? <laughs> we want to know about him and we want to know him. But we don't really know him if we don't know about him. That's why the scriptures are preserved for us. Uh, Jesus isn't some mystical entity out there that we just automatically know. That's why God has spoken and written his word so that we may be able to identify whom we are speaking of because there are other powers out there wanting to claim the position of Jesus. And we know that to the many religions of this world claiming the place of the Messiah. But we know by the scriptures that what they are saying about this supposed Jesus is different than what the Jesus says that came to us through the prophetic line, right? So Satan is going to try to counterfeit Jesus in multiple ways and has been doing for multiple centuries, but it's going to get worse at the end of time. So that's why we need to get into the Word and understand who Jesus is and how incredible Jesus is and what an incredible thing our Father has done in sending his Son into this world. So I mentioned that even within the Adventist church, which I believe is the closest we can get to the biblical truth, and we're still learning, that's why I say that, um, even there I think there's questions that we have about understanding Jesus. Um, the Sabbath school lesson I noticed was talking about Jesus' divine power. Uh, am I correct? Because I, I taught last week's lesson down at New River Valley Church, uh, and I glanced at the following week, and I thought, oh, they're actually talking about Jesus' divine power. But I noticed they neglected, now they may do it in a later lesson, but they neglected to explain the phrase, laid aside divinity. So I imagine there'll be a lot of people that have read this week's lesson that will feel a certain amount of confusion because another discipline in the, in the theology concentrates on his laying aside of divinity. Now, last sermon, I don't know if you remember, but I explained something about that because through my own study, I found a lack of understanding of what that meant. And I showed you two different quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy where she had to change her wording because of that misunderstanding was even existing in her day. I'll explain what the misunderstanding was about the laying aside of divinity and what the correct understanding is about the laying aside of divinity. And even though I preached it last week and I thought I covered it pretty well, there was two individuals that had a major problem with what I presented because it's so untraditional to what they've heard. And they thought I was saying something altogether Different. I got read the whole Baker letter from start to finish. I don't know if you know how long that is, as a sort of a rebuke. The funny thing is, the Baker letter supported everything I said. <laughs> it's a complete backup of what I said because I read that Baker letter. Uh, I'll explain to you what's in it years ago, and I was struck and convicted by it. And in that letter that the little messenger of the Lord wrote, she was warning people against the mistake of making Christ only human. He was fully human, but that's different to being only human. Do you understand? Because he was fully divine. We all know this. This is a sort of Christian doctrine for centuries, and it's substantiated by the Bible. He was fully divine and fully human at all points, right? But that's a bit of a mystery. <laughs> it is hard for us to explain, but yet he was both. So the question then is, is okay, I want to talk about how Christ helps us because I was talking a little bit with Brenda last week. My wife and I were talking too and the importance of, you know, the theology is important, but what we really want to know is why can Jesus help us so much and how can we be helped? And the other question we need to ask is, do we need to be helped? And then a fourth question would be, how do we need to be helped? Because most of the Christian world that's falling into apostasy and assimilating the spirit of the beast simply believes that Jesus is there to pay for your sin. And that is very true. But that is not 
the only reason he's there. There's a bigger problem than paying for your sin concerning you. Satan has made accusation against each one of you. And his accusation is, you cannot keep the law of God, therefore you should not be allowed into the everlasting kingdom. Right? That's his accusation. You, your humanity, it's faulty. God made a mistake, and you cannot keep the law of God. So Jesus didn't just come to pay for your sin. He came to empower you to be born again so that you may live as a citizen of heaven in this world. Now, obviously, that's a learning experience. But when God sees it happening, he knows it's happening. It doesn't mean you get everything right, but he sees the change. He knows there's an element of life in you because you've accepted Jesus that he can produce with evidence. So he's left his judgment based on evidence. And his judgment is based on evidence. It's based on looking at the actual evidence. Can you imagine going to a trial and the judge saying, um, innocent, and the people say, wait a minute, where's the evidence that he's innocent? Oh, we don't need evidence. Of course you need evidence. So even in our secular world, we understand the need of evidence. God is also using evidence in our vindication, which came through Christ. And that's why our works are examined. This is not a popular system in Christianity today because they've, many of them have done away with the works of the Christian and said that, well, the only thing that's ever seen is the works of Jesus, and you're sort of covered up with a Band-Aid, and even though you continued on sinning just like everybody else, you get to go into heaven. Or maybe you did a little bit less, you know, that's sort of the in intermediate position. But that's, that is the result of not studying your Bible, right? Because if we study the Bible, well, we look at that today. I'll get into the lesson and show. It's obvious that the Christian is supposed to bear fruit. The Christian is supposed to be different. Yes, we are all, you know, we've all participated in sin. We've all been tainted by sin, but we can be born again, and a new life is evidential, and the law of God can actually be used to prove that in the judgment. So anyway, uh, let's look at the next. So the ladder, the title was The Ladder, uh, Climbing the Ladder, because that's really what we want to know. We want to know, do we have to climb this ladder? What is the ladder, right? And the comforting thing is, it's nice to know that the ladder is not a set of principles alone. The ladder is Jesus Christ. And this theme comes from ancient scriptures, from Jacob and his struggle with the angel, and also Jacob and his struggle with assurance, right? Jacob had sinned. He had Listen to the advice of his mother, which at that point was the wrong advice, and both of them had sinned. They tried to do the Lord's work for him, which is a big mistake, right? We need to do it the Lord's way. And even though they probably meant well, it was uh, Satan had gained a victory there. But Jesus refers to this ladder that Jacob saw. Some talk of it as a stairs. It doesn't matter. Same basic illustration. And he says... Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. John 151. Note the words carefully, upon the Son of Man. It's not that Jesus is just giving us a set of principles that we need to abide by, and therefore we climb our way to heaven. No, that would be paganism. Jesus is going to tell us, you can't do that. And you'll see that in the scriptures. You're not able to do that unless you go through me and you're part of me. And we look at the vine illustration as well. But upon the Son of Man, Jesus, over his dead body and his resurrected body, we are climbing. But we still have to climb. Now, it doesn't say here that we have to climb. So where do I get that idea? Let's base my statements on evidences. So, look at the scripture that we read, okay? Grace and peace be multiplied. This is 2 Peter chapter 1 and a few verses there, starting at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So, Jesus came to pay our sin debt. What else did he come to give us? He gave us pardon. What else? 
What does it say? Power. Absolutely. According as who, and what power is it? His divine power. Now you may say, well, that's probably God's, not Jesus's. But remember in John, it says the word was with God and the word was God. So there's no way we can get out of the fact that this is still Jesus' power because it's the power of the Godhead. It belongs to the Spirit, it belongs to the Father, and it belongs to the Son. It's their power, and so it's his power. You understand? Anyway, so this power that he's given unto us, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, to the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So we need a knowledge of him. Jesus has told us things that explain who he is and why he's able to help, and we're going to be looking at that today. And I don't think it's really understood as it should be among many of us. But anyway, 2 Peter 1.3, let's go on in the same scripture. Whereby are given unto us exceeding, I love that word, exceeding great. That's another adjective that increases, right? Exceeding great and precious promises. Okay? That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. You see, the Babylonian message doesn't focus on this. It focuses on God being a favoritist. So you say you believe that Jesus died for you, you get to heaven, and the others don't. And it has nothing to do with how you live. Now, most Christians don't really believe what I've said, but ultimately, the Babylonian confusion can lead to that error, right? Because it doesn't make clear that Christ came to make us partakers of divine nation, so, uh, nature so that we may escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, why would we need to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust? Because in the judgment, if you haven't escaped it, you don't belong in the eternal kingdom. You need to escape it. That's what Christ came to give you. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control or temperance, and to temperance endurance or patience. Endurance is probably a better translation. And to endurance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness agape, the, the divine love, the love that is willing to die for others. That's really what the charity in the King James is trying to describe there in Old English. Um, it's agape. It's the deepest love, right? For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.8. Now let's go on. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So you received forgiveness. So it's possible to be forgiven and then fall back and not realize the purpose, right? What happens to those? They're, wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So are the previous category making their calling and election sure? What was the previous one? The blind ones? Are they making their calling and election sure? No, they're making it unsure because they're failing to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this is why Seventh-day Adventists have a little different gospel. Now, there are other Christians also who preach this. They just can't preach it as fully as we can because they don't understand the judgment and the proof that the judgment brings. Investigative judgment. The fact that we are examined by our fruits, you know, in the, in the final uh, test. So anyway, uh, so we as Christians, we want to know how to be successful. It's very important. Wherefore, rather, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. We have something to do with making our calling and election sure. But we need to understand what that is because for some, this can set us off on a works focus that actually is counterproductive. We don't want to be focused on works. We want to find out what we're to be focused on so that the works happen. You get the difference? You don't want to be just focused on the works. You want to be focused on the means to being fruitful. Okay. Wherefore, I will not be negligent. I better move on, but Peter's just saying, I'm going to remind you of this. This is important. You need to keep in mind and be conscious whether or not you are progressing or you're just becoming blind and floating along with the rest of the crowd and you'll be found wanting. And Okay, you say, well, that, you're taking too much out of that text. I need more. Well, okay. Uh, 
Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. He's talking about the race. I told you about my own testimony. I was a distance runner, so I understand this very well uh, because I lived it for uh, about 10, 15, 15 years. No, I keep on disciplining my body and making it serve me. Last verse, verse 27, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not somehow be disqualified from the race for the crown, the eternal crown. So there are conditions that still exist because Satan can still say, yeah, he says he, he, he accepts your forgiveness, but look at his life. He's continued to live a rebellious life. And you're keeping me out of the kingdom for living a rebellious life, and you're going to let him in? You see, Satan would have a case, wouldn't he? That would not be fair. But God can say, no, actually, look at his life. It's changed. There's a miracle that's happened, right? We're not talking about occasional misdeeds or sinning occasionally when, you, when the devil catches you off guard. We're talking about the tenor of the life here, okay? Because we have forgiveness as Christians if we fail. We can get up. The righteous man falls seven, what's it, seven times and gets up. Huh? Yeah. So, Jesus warns of the result of faithlessness. Look, I'm standing at the door and knocking. I'm using a more modern translation here because I think it just brings it home a little better. If anyone listens to my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. This is the key. And eat with him, and he will eat with me. This is Revelation 3, 20 and 21. To the one who conquers, I will give a place to sit with me on my throne. Now, let me ask you a question. I've asked this before. What would happen if he doesn't conquer? Logically, what would happen if, if this one doesn't conquer? We have to ask this question. Would he sit with Jesus on his throne? No. There's a condition again. And it sounds scary in a sense, like, oh man, I have to perform. I have to do this. And we well know how often we fail. Right? We know that as Christians. It'd be nice if once we accepted Jesus, we had a plane sail all the way, you know, to the heavenly kingdom. We never, uh, well, any teacher knows, any teacher knows that for a student to learn something that he doesn't know, and that's difficult, he's going to have to go through failure. Because sometimes the failures teach you more than the success. Once you're at that position of being in a, in a, a position of ignorance, to get to the point of knowledge and to get to the point of success, you know, you're going through for the first time, the second time. It takes a while to learn, and God knows that. So he's patient. He's loving. But he does have to get you somewhere. He does have to get you somewhere so the devil cannot use the evidence that you're producing against you, right? He does have to get us to a changed life, and he will. And it starts at the cross right there. Right? Don't, don't think that, you know, I'm not saved yet. I'm, I, I shouldn't put it that way because that word's confusing when we use it in that context. I'm not in Christ yet. No, when you come to Christ, you're in him. You have eternal life. You're being saved. You're with him. Because if you're not with him, you have no hope. So you're not trying to win his favor, right? And th that's a mistake a lot of Christians make. On the other hand, you don't want to go to the other extreme and think, oh, well, uh, I'm in like Flynn, and there's no, no conditions. That's stupid. It's not in Scripture. I'm sorry I have to be graphic there. It is stupid. It's, it's, it's stupidity that ignores Scripture. All right. Uh, and I've been stupid many times, so don't if you've ever thought that, don't think I'm being mean to you. I'm admitting that I've made the same sort of mistakes. But anyway, um, Spirit of Prophecy, the messenger of the Lord, received many visions and many supernatural things happened with this little lady. Incredible things that showed that this was supernatural. Then we got to determine which supernatural is it, the good or the bad. And it turns out to be the good because she agrees with Scripture. But anyway, she says the same thing. I'm not going to read all of this because otherwise it's too much, but it's basically talking about progressing and climbing the ladder. And this is the quote that I had a dream about when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, about climbing a ladder and a storm that would come against this climbing of the ladder, that I saw a great storm that would come and bring doubt into people's minds as to whether they really needed to climb this ladder or not. Because you hear the voice of apostate Christianity saying, oh, that's too hard. All you have to do is just believe Jesus died for your sins, and there's no conditions after that. And it's crept into Adventism, believe it or not. There are many, there was many names I could mention, the fact that 
ended up being this fellowship from the church, preachers that tried to introduce this idea. Desmond Ford is one of them. You know, as long as you believe in Jesus, it's nothing got to do with, with uh, performance after that. You're into heaven. That's just the way it is. Everybody gets to be saved in that sense. And the scriptures say something different, don't they? You agree? He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved, it says. So anyway, uh, she. but I wanted to, to focus on the second part, because in the dream, I saw a ladder that I had to climb, and it was very difficult, and it came to the point where I was just, just recent convert. I couldn't climb anymore, right? I saw the storm, and I, I didn't accept the storm. I knew I had to climb. I climb, and I get to the point where I can't climb anymore, and I wake up, and I have this question. What is this dream about? I felt encouraged, but I couldn't explain it. Um, that's why you study, right? You go into the Word of God and the testimonies that God has given us to find what is the Lord trying to tell me. This was like, not like any normal dream, I'm telling you. It was very, very powerful. And also a part of it came to pass two, two or three years later in my life, part of what the dream showed me, which told me. It was another way of me knowing this was from the Lord. But anyway... It, Apart from that, just look at the evidence I'm presenting. She says, let no one say, I cannot remedy my defects of character. If you come to this decision, you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. The impossibility lies in your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of God. Colossians 3.31.2. So I was listening to an evangelist preach the opposite to this and saying that this was too hard. He was an Adventist evangelist, and on the side of the board, this was written. <laughs> he didn't know about it. And the classroom was the classroom that was in my dream years earlier, and here was this evangelist teaching this. So it was very powerful, and it convinced me, but now I need to share it with you, because I believe God doesn't just share things like that for no reason, right? There's an importance here. All right, God knew that a great storm was going to come against the conditionality of our salvation. He knew it. So that people think they're just going to fall asleep like Laodiceans and have an easy time and just wait for Jesus to come. That's what the devil wants you to do. But then um, this is a beautiful quote that explains more about Jesus because that's, you know, that song, more about Jesus, I would know, more of his saving fullness show. Right? Christ is a ladder that Jacob saw, the base resting on the earth, and the topmost round reaching to the gate of heaven. So remember those two things. The base on the earth, the top reaching heaven. Let's read on. If that ladder had failed by a single step of reaching the earth, we should have been lost. Now this is not a physical ladder. So how is Jesus reaching the earth? Well, we'll study that. Um... It's obviously a metaphor, right? So, uh, but Christ reaches us where we are. It gives you a little bit more clue. The we there is us. Christ reaches us where we are, okay? And where are we? We're in this humanity that has no power. He tells us that in John 15. He took our nature and overcame that we too taking his nature might overcome. That's an interesting statement. There's two different natures there. He takes our nature and overcame that we too taking his nature. Now, if it's the exact same nature, then you're going nowhere. You see, you have to have two different natures for leverage here. You have to have the nature we have that needs help, and you have to have a nature that is help. Do you understand? Because otherwise, nothing changes. Anyway, we're going to find out what his nature is. Even though he took our nature, that's not the sum of Jesus. If it was, we'd be in big trouble. And this is my point. I'm one of the side of the theology that they can't really explain. If he just takes our nature, we're all washed up. We need something more. Okay? But if he doesn't take our nature, we're also washed up. Because he can't reach us where we're at. It's illegal for Christ to reach us beyond our nature. He can't do that. He has to become one of us to pay the debt. Because a son of Adam has to pay the debt. Made in the likeness of sinful flesh, Romans 8.3, she's citing scripture there. He lived a sinless life. Now by his divinity, he lays hold upon the throne of heaven. And by his humanity, he reaches us. You see the two natures? 
You notice the personal pronoun, his divinity, he reaches heaven, and his humanity, he reaches us, right? And what type of humanity is that that the Bible calls? What type of humanity does it call it here in Romans 8 3? Sinful flesh, thank you. Right. Uh, that's distinct from sinless flesh, isn't it? Okay. But it doesn't, a lot of people jump to a conclusion that sinful flesh means Christ must have been a sinner. No, it doesn't. And we'll see why he didn't become a sinner when we do. Okay. Um, that's Desire of Ages 3.11. You know, James makes the point that I made earlier as well. I've given you several testimonies. Paul, Jesus, and John, and here James. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Don't look at this as faith plus works. That's the way we often present it. Well, I need faith. And I need works. That's not what this scripture says. It says faith that possesses works. Faith from which works come. See, some people think, well, I have to believe, and then I have to do this. They don't understand what believing is then. Because you can believe something, or you can believe in something. Is there a difference? Well, there certainly can be, right? I can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but I may not believe in him. We'll develop that as we go on. So Jesus wants us to believe in him. He wants, to have, he wants us to have that faith that works. Okay? I had this discussion last week with one of the individuals that was trying to correct me for the message. I was several weeks back saying you need to add works to faith, and I'm like, no, you need the faith that works. <laughs> Much better focus, right? So look at Jesus, what he says. I am the vine. This is John 15. I am the true vine. I like that, the true vine, because there's lots of false vines. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Again, I'm using the LITV translation here because I'm always looking for a little bit closer translation. And some of these translations are actually terrible in other areas, but they might hit on a, a better interpretation. How do we know it's a better interpretation? If you understand something about the Greek, it helps you decide where are the translations doing a better job. And the reason why I chose this one has to do with the way the word pruning is used in Greek. But anyway, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me not bearing fruit he takes away, and each one bearing fruit he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You already pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. So believing in Jesus' word, I didn't say believing his word, but believing in Jesus' word, catch the difference, prunes us, right? Remain in me and I in, and I in you. As the branch is not able to bear fruit of itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. So there's the key. Remember I said don't focus on the works. So what do we focus on? Remaining in Jesus. Now, we have to understand that. We have to unpack that. Because that's just a word. Otherwise, we need to understand what that means. Okay? So we are going to bear fruit if we remain in Jesus. Okay? Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. He goes on to emphasize it again. And you know when Jesus says something several times over, it's important, right? Um, and he tells what will happen if you don't remain in him, right? And if you don't bear fruit, you end up being burned. That's what I, I, I do prune. That's my job. And I, I know fruit tree pruning, and I know ornamental tree pruning. And they're a little different, but ultimately, the stuff that's pruned out altogether is burned, right? And then there are the branches that you prune parts of, and they're saved, okay? Um, it's all based in love. As my father loved me, I also loved you, continue in my love. So now Jesus puts it in, in another framework. Abiding in him is continuing in his love. It's not just continuing to love him, that's part of it, but it's continuing in his love. Can we unpack that? What is it to be in his love as opposed to loving him? If I don't readdress that, remind me, okay, sweetie? The difference between loving Jesus and remaining in his love. Remind me to clarify that if I don't come back to it. Okay. 
So vine and branch distinction. Did you the distinction? Did you catch there a difference? Jesus is the vine. We're only the branch. What's the difference? Well, again, I, I know pruning. I, I cut a branch off. What can that branch do as it sits in the air, cut off from the vine? It can only die. That's all it can do. And you coming from the original vine, which was Adam, all you can do is die. Right? The original part of the tree. And so we need a new Adam. That's what the scriptures is saying. Jesus is the last Adam. We need a new Adam. We need a new nature that we can be infused with. Because what Adam is left over with, yeah, he can become born again, but he can't pass that on to you. Because that's a spiritual born again, right? So his, his humanity that he passes on, he can't pass on the born again part. He can only pass on what was damaged. So Christ comes and he takes what's damaged, but he's bringing something into it. And this is something we need to understand uh, that gives us courage in fighting against sin, right? So let's look at the distinctions. We want to figure out what's the same. What is it that, that's the same with the vine and the branch? That's a question for you. And this time you are going to have to answer. What is the same between the vine and the branch? Oh, I'm glad you said that because it shows a little misunderstanding. Don't be mad at me. The vine is referring to the whole plant. When I say a grape vine, I'm not talking about the grape stem. I'm talking about the whole plant. So the stem is a part and the root is another part, but that's the vine. That's the plant. In other words, if we were to translate this, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Philip, because I thought about that. If we were to translate this into modern English, we'd say, I am the plant and you are the branches. Not I am the stem and you are the branches. You understand? Notice, because Jesus does clarify he says, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. He's not the root. He's the vine dresser. So we don't just have a stem and a vine dresser. We have the whole plant and a vine dresser. Got it? Okay. So, but I'm glad you said that because it really helped. What is the same then? What is the same? Yeah, but is, it, is there a material that's the same with the branch and the vine? Wood, right? They're both wood. Do you know in Scripture, wood is often used as a metaphor for our humanity, right? The sanctuary, the pillars were made out of wood, but they were gilded in what? Gold. There you have humanity and divinity combined. You have the glory of the gold on top of the wood. Because the sanctuary represents the temple, and all through the New Testament, the temple represents humanity. And I, I prove it to you, John 1.14. If you want to flip there real quick, I mean, it's in here, but John 1.14, the word became flesh or humanity and encamped in us or among us. Right? You have a divine spirit dwelling in a temple of flesh. The original temple was made out of wood, eventually became stone. We also have stone being used as a symbol for humanity. Peter says, you are lively stones built upon the cornerstone, which, by the way, is not Peter, it's Christ. Sorry to the papacy on their inaccuracy there. It's Christ is the cornerstone, right? Peter is a foundation stone, but he's not the cornerstone. There's only one cornerstone that we're talking of there. So... No, I wouldn't say that, and I'll tell you why. There's a distinction. Have you ever grafted anything? Okay. Um, what do you need? If you have a branch, what do you need to graft it to? The whole plant, the plant that's living, because the branch can't live by itself. The plant can, in a sense. So... To clarify a little, I mean, you're on the right track, but basically, they're both made out of the same material. That's why, I mean, if I took a metal branch and put it on the vine, what would happen? So why is it that they can meld together? Because they're the same. This is where the sameness is essential in the gospel, that, you know, the original writers said Christ took 
the sameness, which is what the word in Greek means, of sinful flesh. In other words, he took the humanity that came broken from Adam. Now, this is greatly resisted by modern theology because of Augustine, and I mentioned that before, and his ideas about, you know, the old Gnostic idea that material was sin and spirit was pure, and therefore Christ couldn't take the material that was sin, and so it had to be some sort of special hocus-pocus humanity that Christ got, you know. The Calvinists to this day defend that idea, by the way, along with the Catholics. And that's where we get the Immaculate Conception idea from. But anyway, what is the same is that the humanity is the same. In the vine, it's the wood that's the same, right? The, the two things know each other, and they can blend together. And so Christ had to take our humanity in order to be able to become our atonement. Because a divine person dying for me, just being divine, doesn't atone for the sin of my father, Adam. But somebody coming into my realm, into my humanity, can't. That's just the way the Bible describes it. You can ask God when you get there why it had to be that way, but trust me, God knows what he's doing, right? <laughs> he knows the rules of the game. So what is the same? It's the humanity, okay? Uh, now, don't figure into that humanity, oh, well, what about all the sin in my humanity? The sin gets there through another means. It doesn't come through DNA. Now, this is a big mistake that a lot of people make. Oh, it's the DNA. Well, if that were the case, then Christ would have received sin and could not have been our atonement. So you can't use that argument. Now, obviously, the DNA is affected by sin, right? The material that makes up our humanity. But you have to understand that sin is a spiritual thing. It happens in the mind, not in the flesh itself. A dead man can't sin. He still has flesh, but it's dead flesh. It can't do anything. There has to be, it involves thought, sin, you know. To, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, that's sin. It doesn't just involve action, by the way. It involves thinking in agreement. It's, it's, not a it's not a sin to be tempted. So you might have a thought cross your mind and say, oh, I've sinned, that thought crossed my mind. No, until you, you accept it, it's not a sin. Satan accepted things of the mind of Jesus, but Jesus' thoughts repelled them, and he did not sin, Right? We need to learn to live like him and to do, and he will teach us how to do that. But anyway, what is the same is the humanity. What is different? That's what we're going to find out. Because Christ has to be both the same in one sense and different in another. What was different between the vine and the branch? So the same was the wood and the plant DNA and everything was the same. And that plants do have sort of a DNA thing going on. What's going on? Uh, that's different. Because the branch can't bear the vine. The vine can bear the branch. What has the branch got a fountain of that doesn't stop, that the branch runs out of? The life. John chapter 1 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So the sap represents the life that divinity has of itself. Now, the word in Greek there is not just a normal word for life. It's, I think it's zoe, I'm not positive, but it means unborrowed, underived, and little messenger on the Lord, having no Greek, writes that because she was given insight supernaturally. She said, unborrowed, underived life. John makes that point. It's like, oh, Christ has life and you have life. No, 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 no. You're the branch. He's divine. He has the sap. You don't. So he comes into humanity, and that divinity comes into humanity, and a new element of life now exists in that vine. The, the new Adam that has life, the old Adam. And I, I, there's a scripture, you know that scripture where it says, the first Adam was a living soul, the last Adam is a quickening, a life-giving spirit. Okay? Jesus did not lose his divinity when he became human. But what did happen? And we're going to look into that because in the last sermon I said I would cover that and the individuals that rebuked me afterwards said I avoided it. And I said, no, I said in the sermon I was going to cover it. They said, oh, I didn't hear that. So I went back and listened to my sermon and sure enough, I did say it. So sometimes when you become upset, you don't hear what the person is saying. But anyway, they thought I was attacking a truth that I'm actually defending. Why is Jesus the same and yet different? Well, these are some of the scriptures and because I don't want to go on too long, just jot them down, but I can tell you what's in them. John 1.14, the word became flesh and tabernacle. Two things. 
Don't think they're the same thing. To be made flesh and to tabernacle are two different things. There are two natures being involved there. One is the made nature, which is hum human. The other is the tabernacling nature, which is divinity. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 2, 16 through 8, you have the same thing happening. In all points made like unto his brethren. That tells me he is, his humanity is ours. But what happens in the humanity is what's different. And why? That's the question. Romans 8, 3, God sent his son in the likeness of our sameness of sinful flesh, the Greek word meaning sameness. Uh, and Philippians 2 proves that it means sameness because Philippians 2, 7 says he's made in the likeness of men. So if we take likeness in Romans 8, 3 not to mean sameness, then we'd have to force it to not mean sameness in Philippians 2. So it does mean sameness. It has to because did he become human? Yes. Did he take sinful flesh humanity? Yes, they both mean the same thing. Okay. Uh, okay. So Christ was truly God, but he did not try to remain equal with God. This is Philippians 2.7. Instead, he gave up everything and became a slave when he became like one of us. And the Greek word used for like is one that means same. Okay. He did take the same humanity. That does not make him the same when you have an extra ingredient. I explained it like if I take flour and I add to it uh, a leaven and water and a few other things and I bake it, what happens? And I let it rise and I bake it. What have I got? Bread. If I take flour and I leave it on the table and my dog gets into it and spreads it all over the floor, laughs up some of it, what have I got? A mess, yeah. So what we have coming from Adam is a mess. Christ makes bread out of it, life. Because divinity and humanity are combined. Oh, he can't use his divinity. Well, I'll explain that. Because there are ways in which Christ did not and did give up the direct use of his own divinity, but never think that means he separated from his divinity. Okay? Because it was essential that his divinity be involved in our redemption. So anyway, that was the Greek word there. It's what we get the word homogenous from, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, Romans 8, 3, what the law, well, let me read the second translation for time. In so much as the law was impotent or unable to produce by the means of the weakness of flesh of our humanity, the law couldn't help us. God sent his son in the sameness of sinful flesh on account of sin that he might in the flesh condemn sin. Okay. Notice he sent his son into that. Okay, um, and there's the Hebrews text that you can look up. Um, the difference, okay, he's the vine, he has life. Colossians 2.9 says, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now it can dwell in us through the Holy Spirit, but Jesus did not need an atonement for it to dwell in him because he was it. <laughs> we need an atonement. We need to get it by him, by the sap, right? Um, and made and dwelt in John 1, 14. That's the difference, who he is and remains distinct. And that's what the Baker letter I mentioned is all about. Be very, very careful not to make him altogether such a one as ourselves because he was, you know, she says that holy thing, that divinity and humanity were combined in him. And when the lady was reading the letter to me, she sort of paused a little when she read that part because that's exactly what my sermon was about, the, the unity of divinity and humanity, right? Okay. Um, that's that quote we already read. It's about the divinity and humanity. Now look at this one. Beautiful. Christ had two natures, the nature of a man and the nature of God. In him, divinity and humanity were separated, right? No, combined. Now I've been told multiple times they're separated. And I had to think, where are they getting this from? I'm not seeing it. Oh yeah, they're separated. His divinity was dormant. No, where are you getting that from? It's a misunderstanding of another quote. But anyway, upon his meditorial work hangs the hope of the perishing world. So Christ couldn't mediate for us if he wasn't the combination of divine and human. Why is that? So the how, by the way, is a mystery. People tell me, you shouldn't talk about that because Elmite says it's a mystery and you shouldn't talk about it. She said how they're blended is a mystery. The fact that they're blended, she stated over and over again and said it was essential. So the why is essential to discuss the how is not essential, okay? Because we can't understand how the specifics of how the two natures are blended. We don't even understand divine nature exactly. We know it exists, but we don't, can't explain it. 
you can explain more about our humanity, but even parts of that are a mystery. Um, this is another statement. Christ could have done nothing during his earthly ministry in saving fallen man if the divine had not been blended with the human. Now people say, well, stop. That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave up his divinity and he received the Holy Spirit. That's what made the difference. Well, I wouldn't argue that he received the Holy Spirit, but whose nature does the Holy Spirit have? The nature of God, and whose nature is that? Jesus' own nature. So it's sort of a full circle, right? So yes, he was strengthened by the Holy Spirit, but on what authority could be strengthened by the Holy Spirit? And the, the authority that he was the divine son of God. So it goes full circle. We cannot be strengthened by the divine Holy Spirit unless we receive his atonement, okay, his blood. So uh, she, can, she talks about the, the mystery of the blending, and yet she's telling us, say, we're blended. So don't tell me I shouldn't talk about that because we're actually talking about it in our own writings. Um, anyway, what happened? I think I did that. I pressed the wrong button. Okay. <laughs> I learned a new trick. <laughs> okay. Um, was it the Holy Spirit's divinity? Well, I shouldn't say no because in a sense it is, but no in the sense that the Scripture is telling us this. The Savior was anxious and the prophet of the Lord was telling us the Savior was anxious for his disciples to understand why his divinity was united to humanity. Now, I could rest that solely in Scripture because the Word tabernacled in flesh. And the Word is the divine nature of the Son of God. Okay, That's in Scripture. So she's just saying what Scripture says. But sometimes I have to show it in spirit of prophecy because some people will not even accept the Bible unless they see it in spirit of prophecy, which is a mistake. But nevertheless, it's something that's happened in our culture in the church because it a lot of people don't know how to study the Bible and even understand it. And that was never the intent of spirit prophecy. But nevertheless, the problem exists. A divine spirit dwelt in a temple of flesh, writes one author. She writes, he united humanity with divinity. A divine spirit dwelt in the temple of flesh. She's quoting and referring to John 1.14. Another statement says, I'm going fast, basically... Um, he lived the law of God and honored it in a world of transgression, revealing to the world's unfallen, to the heavenly universe, to Satan, and to all the fallen sons and daughters of Adam, that through his grace, humanity can keep the law of God. He came to impart his own divine nature, his own image to the repentant, believing soul. She's bang on. This is exactly what Scripture is teaching. And yet, people are using her writings to deny this. It's ironic, isn't it? Um... A new element of life, that's that famous quote, had to be imparted by him who made the world. Who made the world? Which was it? The Father or Jesus? Well, specifically, we're told that Jesus was the one. The Father, right, is God. But we're told in John, all things were made by him. And who's the him? It's the word. So they're all working together. It's not like, oh, one's better than the other. They're equal. But it was the Father's will that the Son be directly involved in making all things. Okay? That's what the Scripture says. So We have a theme here of why the Son is being pointed out all the time in Scripture, because he's our redemption. Um, so there's two ways of looking at the problem. When you believe that you must overcome, which I'm guessing you're tracking with me on that, um, there's two ways of looking at it, and I've been, I was explained one way that actually caused me not to be able to climb the ladder. You know? And so I'm going to caution you against that idea. Um, and so this is the way. Christ became just like us by laying aside his divinity, and then he took a hold of the Holy Spirit, which was already available to us all, and he proved that our humanity can overcome by taking a hold of the Holy Spirit. There's a problem with that equation. It's missing something major. It doesn't, for one thing, accept the illustration of the vine and the branch. That's just a branch and a branch. That's just Jesus, uh, I'll put my divinity aside, I'll step into humanity, and now I'm just really operationally just human, and I'm just going to show that by reaching up and taking hold of the Holy Spirit, that, and you can do the same, you can be saved. Okay? There's a better example. That's the way it sort of came across to me, and it caused me a lot of problems. And you can never defeat the storm that's coming with that. Because they're just going to laugh at you and say, yeah, you're believing in salvation by works there. You know. Anyway, uh, this is the other one. 
Christ took our needy nature in a sense that did limit his divinity. It did, and we'll talk about that at the very end in the next few minutes. And yet, in another sense, united his divinity with the needy humanity he took, thus elevating it. That was the element of life that we all needed. So it did limit him to take our humanity, but it didn't mean he had to divest himself of his divinity. And it did mean that his divinity would be involved in restoring us. So when you're praying to Jesus, understand the power and the might that you're, you're praying to a being who has divinity of his own to give you, to empower you. Not that you become divine, but that you can be empowered by his divinity, which he won the right to give to you. The Holy Spirit didn't win the right. The Father didn't win the right. They chose that the, the second person would be the one who would have to win the right. Right? That's why we, we pray. Do we pray in the name of the Father? Do we pray in the name of the Holy Spirit? No, we pray in the name of Jesus because the Godhead chose that to be the method. All right. Um, how is divinity laid aside and limited? Well, here are some of the examples of how. Now, I have a whole study, and it's all in my book, and I use Bible quotes and spirit prophecy quotes to back it up, but we don't have that much time, so I'm showing you. He suffered being tempted. Hebrews tells us that. God was never tempted by sin. Divinity is not tempted by sin. It sees right through it. It's not fooled. It's not deceived. It's impossible for God to be tempted by sin. He is goodness. There's no evil in him, no darkness at all. I mean, sin just, he's, he's going to laugh at it. That's ridiculous. Why would I sin, right? But when he becomes human, he gives up some aspects of divinity, like the all-knowing and, and the omnipresence, right? And he has to operate as a human being. And Satan brings to bear upon this starving individual in the desert, hey, turn these stones into bread because you say you're the son of God, you know? And it didn't appear as this grotesque, horned beast, so that Jesus is like, oh, that's the devil, don't listen to anything he says. No, he appears as a beautiful angel. The movies always get this wrong. He appears as a beautiful angel, as he is, and is, is implying to Jesus that, hey, I'm an angel from heaven. Go ahead, you know, show your divinity. And Jesus, his, his human mind, you know, he's struggling. He's, his mind isn't working that well. He's starving. But he has his faith in the word of God, and he remembers Man shall not live by bread alone, right? So as a human, he's having to go through this test. But it's humanity elevated and suspended by his divinity. He had to pray for strength and power as a human being. He had to, now as a divine being only, did he ever have to pray for strength and power? No, because he is that strength and power. But now he has to experience weakness and inclinations of, the flesh, instinctive inclinations, starving, wanting food, right? What other way? He, used, he laid aside the direct use of his divinity, apparently, as far as I can tell. And there is a spirit of prophecy statement that talks about that desire of ages 336. It says that power he had laid down. So I want to give you clear evidence that there is a way that he laid aside divinity. It just doesn't mean he laid away his divine nature. It's a different meaning. You know, words are awkward sometimes. You have to fill out a bunch of sentences to really get the point across. Um, so he prays to the Father regarding Lazarus. And so people would say, now people tell me, oh, well, it wasn't by Jesus' power that Lazarus was raised. Well, in a sense, it was. Because the Father was answering the divinity of Christ and knowing that his son deserved to be answered in his prayer for Lazarus to be healed. He acknowledges Jesus' divinity and the power of God raises Lazarus, but was the power of God Jesus as well? Yeah. Is his as well. So we can, the Sabbath school lesson is okay. It, we can say it's Jesus' divinity because it is in a sense. It's just that he gave up the direct use of it, right? Because as a divine being, he just would have said, Lazarus, come forth. Now as a human being, he prays to the fathers for the Father's approval. And he speaks the words. And he doesn't say, Father, make Lazarus come forth. He says, Lazarus, come forth. He spoke it on his own authority. And it's an acknowledgement of him deserving that right as a divine human savior. So anyway, it's a beautiful thing when we look into who Jesus is and what he is. Um, so here we have that scripture in Romans 1, 3, and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's the sinful flesh of David, right? 
and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So he was acknowledged as both things, right, by God, the Father. Um, I love this one, and this is sort of where we're ending, but uh, a few other quotes. But when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words, I lay down my life that I might take it again. So if you're not into spirit prophecy, at least acknowledge the scripture that she quotes correctly, right? She's giving you a scriptural evidence here. So this is the scripture, I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now people try to explain to me, well, it wasn't really Christ that raised himself because he was dead. His divinity was not dead. Divinity can't die. Humanity did die, okay? Somehow, this is a mystery, but Christ was able to take up his human life again, right? That's what it says. I know, know no other way of reading it. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Not my father, but I. He waited for his father's authority because he'd become a subservient servant by taking humanity. Okay? Ah... Uh, this is more on the same thing. I am the resurrection of the life. She says only the deity could say that. Right? We're not the resurrection of the life. That's how we're different from Jesus. And I'm glad that he is different from me and the same as me. He's the same in the way he needs to be and different in the way he needs to be. Right? Never bring him down totally to our level. Uh, that's what the Baker letter warns us against. Um, Again, how do we overcome? This is really it. Now, so we have this incredible Savior who brought this divine life to our disposal. He, it flows out of him to us. The only way it can flow out if he takes our place and becomes the son of Adam. And this is, by the way, really the heart and soul of the 1888 message that Ellen White rejoiced in when she heard it come because it liberated many people from trying to save themselves. When they realized the power was not in them and it wasn't supposed to be in them, but it was in this incredible Savior's love. And you're supposed to remind me, remember? <laughs> right? Abide in his love. So what we abide in, abide in me and I in you. Look at what she says. Abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his spirit, a life unreserved, surrender to his service. The channel of communication must be open continually between man and God as the vine branch constantly draws the sap from the living vine, so are we to cling to Jesus, our ladder, and receive from him by faith the strength and perfection of his own character. Isn't that beautiful? Abiding in his love is believing that regardless of your failures as a human being, even after you become a Christian, Jesus loves you just the same. And it's having confidence that when you come as a failure before God, you say, God, I failed. You have confidence that he says, you're still my son, my daughter. I love you. And just believe that I can give you the help you need. You know, it's a beautiful thing. And even in my life today, I've, I've had to rediscover this many times as a Christian. That, you know, don't look at your failures, but look at the one who is your success right? This message caused a great stir among the Adventist people in the 1890s period when it was given over a period of 10 years. And there were hard-hearted people that tried to block it because they didn't like it because it didn't give enough glory to the humanity part. You know, okay, God does his part. I do mine. I do the works. God rewards me for my works. No, 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 no. <laughs> you have no works that can commend you to God, right? Only the work of Christ, the vine, the fruit that you bear has to come from him. Um, look at this. Is, see, the root sends its nourishment through the branch to the outermost twig. But the root is the vine. It's, it's, it's the plant, the root and the stem. That's Jesus. Okay? The father is the vine dresser. That's the farmer who tends it. Okay? Um, Here is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. 
Uh, again, another, another way that we overcome, it is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. So the study of the Bible and the believing of the love that's shown in the Bible for you is how you overcome. It's really all about love. It's about trusting in the Father's love. Even though you may fail to love him, it's going back and trusting in that love to get a reset, right? Because his love doesn't fail, right? Agape does not fail. The scriptures say that in Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13. That's the end, but I don't know what other way to tell you, but we have an incredible Savior who has done something incredible. What that latter means is that heaven came to us because we couldn't get to it. And that heaven is a person, the person who loves and cares. It's the person of the Godhead in total. The Father and the Spirit love you just as much as Jesus does. They've just decided that this one of them had to make the sacrifice, right? And they all work together in our redemption. So when we pray to the Spirit, we're asking the Spirit to send us Christ's divine nature that he legally united with our humanity. It's not ours, but it's a gift to us. We're never divine, but we are partakers. Okay. So live your life and realize that you can have victory in Jesus. And that the enemy's accusations, because your confessed sins are blotted out, but your successes in Christ are, remain as evidence that Christ has been able to change you and make you worthy of heaven, not by your own works, but by his works in you, right? And by his blood shed for you. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Precious Father, what a wonderful Savior we have. Um, we would learn more and more of this great message that you brought to our people to revive us. But we know that before Babylon falls, this message must go out with a loud cry to the world to show that there is no excuse for the changing of God's law, for the exaltation of men's laws in place, for the mark of the beast to stand in the place of the seal of God. Help us understand the link between these things and righteousness by faith. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Marching to Zion. So we want to sing that with victory in our hearts because now we realize, if you haven't before, that we have a mighty Savior who is more than willing to save. Lord, as we depart, help us to go forward with joyous hearts, rejoicing in the great strength of our Savior and his love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.